Welcome to another edition of the Mistake Free Real Estate Podcast. I am your host, Mark Delator, and today I'm joined by a good friend, Paul Moore. Paul, welcome to the show. It's great to be here, Mark. How are you? Doing great, mate. Um, we uh, go way back now. Uh, you are a member of the Collective Genius Mastermind Group, um, and you were recently uh, in a room at Collective Genius talking about just becoming a boring investor. What's that about? Yeah. <laughs> you know... Mark, I made so many mistakes. I, uh, I I sold my company in 1997, and I thought, I'm a full-time investor now. You're the big-time guy. Yeah, and I thought, <laughs> I'm pretty cool sitting back here, and I wasn't. I was a full-time speculator. I didn't know the difference between investing and speculating, and I thought that the investments I made should give me the same fun and thrill of the chase that I get that I got from being an entrepreneur, but being an entrepreneurial investor was a big mistake for me. It caused me to chase a lot of shiny objects. It caused me to jump from one thing to another, not getting really deep on anything. It caused me to stay in startup mode for years. Did you know a jet has like something like five times, four or five times the engine capacity it needs to cruise from LA to New York? The problem is it has to get off the ground and that, you know, getting up to the normal altitude of 30,000 feet or whatever takes a lot more power. Well, to stay in that mode all the time, it was thrilling. It was fun, but it wasn't very profitable and it wasn't good for my health uh, or my family. So that's kind of what I, I did. It was sort of like being a real estate developer all the time, staying in development mode and never enjoying the ongoing cash flow. And that's that's one of the many things I did wrong over the last 25 years. So what was the turning point for you, Paul? When did you um, finally have that aha moment when you said, I have to stop? Was there, Did you hit a bottom? Because um, I could certainly relate if you did. Um, but did you hit a point or was it just realizing, man, there has to be, um, w- when am I going to reach that high altitude cruising point? Yeah, you know, I it was a lot of different data points, including studying people like Warren Buffett and Howard Marks and Charlie Munger and, you know, just hearing different, you know, people talk about this and, and just realizing how, how long do I want to go on like this? And I actually looked at two significantly, two of the best moments of my life as far as entrepreneurially, when things were going the best, I sabotage both of those two great moments by starting a side business that I thought would be more fun. And it both those both times I lost a lot of money, time, sleep, and didn't, you know, it, it just was a foolish mistake. And I, I just realized I don't want to live that way anymore. Of course, I had to be 50 years old almost till I realized this. You're probably thinking he doesn't look a day over 40. But <laughs> no, seriously, you're probably thinking he doesn't look a day over 70. But seriously, I, I finally just realized enough of this. I want to actually enjoy a business, even if it's not an exciting startup mode all the time. So I know you've got a very successful business right now, and we'll certainly delve into that. What was your business prior that you were pouring all your energies into? Was it um, as a real estate development, or were you in the single family or multifamily space? Well, that was one of the problems, my friend. I was chasing so many shiny objects, I could give you like eight different answers. I mean, I've done so many different things in real estate and outside of real estate. Um, Give the audience a flavor uh, of some of the things that you were most, uh, that that caused, that were, yeah. the most time suck for you. Uh, yeah, well, so as soon as I sold my company, I moved to the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia. That was fun and started a nonprofit organization, then started flipping houses, then started flipping lots at a beautiful resort called Smith Mountain Lake in Virginia. Then I started uh, building houses. Uh, I started a website that uh, to sell residential real estate. Uh, I um, was doing that for years. I have that running in the background still. That website is still throwing off leads and generating revenue for us. Um, I was doing multi, I, I finally started doing multifamily. When I made that turn into multifamily in 2011, uh, that's when I started to settle down and realize the importance of focus and uh, have done a lot better since then. But went from being a multifamily syndicator, now we have a fund that invests in a diversified portfolio 
of commercial real estate assets, including self-storage, mobile home parks, RV parks, multifamily, and more. I'm exhausted from all of your efforts uh, flipping and non-for-profits and selling real estate. That sounds uh, exhausting, just going down that journey again. It really is. You know, and I used to want to put, you know, serial entrepreneur on my business card. And I realized now that was just, I mean, even thinking that way was a mistake on multiple levels. So Wellings Capital is a private equity firm that you now manage. Um, and are you up over a half a billion dollars now uh, in assets? Oh, no. Well, as far as assets, I don't know. So what we do is we don't buy and operate any assets at all. We have narrowed our focus. Gary Keller and Jay Papazon, the one thing yeah. that really helped me narrow my focus. What we do really well is source great operators and they source and manage the deals. So as far as assets, I'm not sure we're in the $80 million of equity raised. Yep. And so if that, you know, with an LTV of what, 60%, I would guess that would be uh, about 200 million in total assets that we're investing in more or less. Fantastic. So you gave a presentation about this journey you'd been on to become a more boring investor. Um, I'd love to take the time to to share with our audience the revelations. You know, there's really 18 points and we'll kind of put them in the show notes so people can follow along. We won't hit every single one, but there's certainly some highlights here of things that you learned along the way. Um, I'm sure there are anecdotes and uh, we'll, we'll leave it to you to kind of digest uh, or share with the audience as you see fit. But um, there are 18 gems that that really hit home with me the first two are that boring investors attain true wealth and enjoy real freedom what does freedom mean to you yeah i mean for me freedom would be the freedom from trading my hours for dollars um the freedom from worrying about the price of my stock options or my crypto account or the next game stop game stop deal um, for me also freedom from toilets, tenants, and trash. That's not for everybody. Cause I mean, that's, you know, that's not, you know, a lot of people are great with that. I talked to a guy today has like 60 doors and it was like, oh, he's really having the time of his life, but freedom to use my time and money to make a difference in the world, freedom from agonizing over every financial decision. Um, I, I came to the conclusion, Mark, that true wealth is assets that having assets that produce cash flow. Mm. Uh, Warren Buffett said, if you don't learn to make money while you sleep, you'll have to work until you die. And so having assets that just go up and down on a whim, it's okay, like to have, let's say, Bitcoin, which I have some of. Um, it's okay to have those, but I mean, to depend on that for true wealth, it's it's not really a reliable store of real wealth because it's not it doesn't have an objective value well, you know the value of commercial real estate is of course it's the net operating income divided by the rate of return or the cap rate and uh that's real value that's true wealth to me when you say um boring investors lose money and make a fortune explain what you mean by that yeah. So I actually hosted a podcast for years called How to Lose Money. And <laughs> I was surprised that we had we interviewed 238 guests and we found out that everybody that came on our show, at least, was uh, had lost money, had lost a significant amount of money, time, sleep, relationships all kinds of things, all kinds of painful things on the road to success. And so by interviewing them, it really helped me feel like I'm not alone. A lot of people made a lot of mistakes. And so the reason I say lose money, but make a fortune is they, you know, great investors, great entrepreneurs learn from mm. their mistakes. They take those mistakes and they turn them into profits they turn them into good decisions in the future and um i think it just takes some humility um i know a guy who uh made a lot of mistakes as many of us did in 2000 in the 2008 era and he was telling me how he went bankrupt and lost everything including his family or at least his spouse 
And, um, but I see him doing the same thing now, unfortunately. I mean, I see him kind of chasing things at the same pace he did in 2000, you know, leading up to 08. And I'm wondering if he really learned. I hope he did. And I hope everybody, you know, does. Everybody on our show certainly did. One of the things that you mentioned is, uh, to that end, is I'll kind of throw them into the same one, but on slides eight and nine, you've got don't chase shiny objects, but boring investors also choose a lane and stay in it. I think um, just personally, that's something that I feel like I have done uh, well over the years. And I always thought that it might have been just candidly out of a little bit of fear, um, just feeling like I didn't know, you know, I'm a single family guy, right? So we're buying on the courthouse steps and that was my lane. I just stuck to it and single family, single family. If I can find a deal, I know the numbers and I know I can make money. I just, the, but my, you know, there's always the, these two voices in your head. And one of them was like, come on, Mark, these guys are no better than you. They're out there doing these multifamily deals. You could do that too. And I don't know if it was fear that kept me from doing it or wisdom or maybe a combination of the two, but I always chose to just stick in single family, um, you know, and, and just truly ride that out. What do you see um, in that lane? Have you seen for many people, was that a common theme in your How to Lose Money podcast that people just got spread too thin? Oh, it was such a common theme, Mark. I mean, so many people just chase shiny objects. I mean, after all, entrepreneurs, they get a lot of thrill from the thrill of the chase. Mm. And as real estate investors, it's really, I mean, uh, honestly, you know, uh, George Soros, uh, a, a brilliant investor, like him or not, uh, said, if investing is entertaining, if you're having fun, you're probably not making any money. Good investing should be boring. Uh, the first U.S. economist to win the Nobel Peace Prize, Paul Samuelson, said investing should be like watching paint dry or watching grass grow. If you want excitement, take $800 and go to Las Vegas. And so I think the best I mean, th imagine Michael Phelps trying to, you know, win a gold medal in 10 different sports. I would imagine you never would have heard of him yeah. because how can you do that? I mean, you know, he, he chose a lane. He chose, you know, speaking of the swimming analogy, he was obsessed with being the best swimmer in the world. And I mean, even practiced, you know, he did the same routine. Very boring. If you look at his life, by the way, just like Warren Buffett as an investor, very unbelievably excruciatingly boring life. But they chose a lane and they stayed in it and they did a really good job. Speaking of that, Bill Gates um, you know, he had a three-step strategy. I don't know if he planned it this way to become the wealthiest guy in the world. You too can follow Bill Gates. Okay, sorry. Anyway, so he chose a lane at a young age, the three steps. Number one, he chose a lane at a young age. He wanted to be involved in technology and computers. That was like in his teens. Second, he found the biggest, most wealthiest most influential company to partner with that would also partner with him. And then third, and here's a little surprise. Third, he did everything in his power to make them successful, mm. to make, you know, Microsoft, not Microsoft, but to make IBM successful. And when he made IBM successful, Microsoft went to the top of the charts. And, you know, it honestly sounds like sort of a go-giver strategy. Do what you can to make other people successful, which I love. And um, I think that that's what a lot of great, truly great entrepreneurs, investors have done well. Man, that resonates. Um, I'm sure there'll be many people listening in the audience that can attest. I mean, one of the things with SBD's model um, that we have incorporated from a long time was always just look, if we can go out and make other people money, if we can do make the best investments on behalf of our investors, um, you know, the rest will take care of itself. And I think that that stands the test of time for those wealth advisors or, you know, fund administrators such as yourself. It's always have the investors interests at heart when you are making the investments as, as your own, right? Mm -hmm. That's right. It's so true. I mean, if you can serve others well, it'll come back around. It's just a law of the universe, isn't it? The thing about being a boring investor is that you can suffer mockery and misunderstanding, right, Paul? <laughs> Tell me yeah. a little bit about um, this concept. I mean, it, it's sometimes the boring investing, uh, to, to be blunt, is just not the sexy thing. 
Yeah, so it, the year was 1999. It was Sun Valley, Idaho, and the wealthiest people in America and some around the world have joined Bill uh, Warren Buffett, Bill Gates, and others uh, at their annual billionaires retreat away from the cameras and the press. And um, people were whispering about Mr. Buffett. They said, you know, he's 69. He, he He's probably getting senile. Maybe, maybe he's lost his edge. He's lost his touch. And his friends were wondering, you know, what was wrong with him? Because he missed the boat. And of course, I'm talking about the tech boom. He refused to invest in tech because again, like we talked about earlier, it didn't have a real value attached to it all the time. Some things did, but a lot of these tech things, we know they weren't making any money and therefore it didn't have a real value that could be pegged to the income and the cap cap rate, if you will, or the PE ratio in the stock world. And so he just doggedly refused to invest in tech. He said, hey, I'll, I'd rather invest in Wrigley because I know how people will be chewing gum in 10 years. I have no idea where the internet will be in 10 years. And of course, just nine months later, when the tech bubble began to crumble and burst eventually, uh, he was proven right again. But he suffered a lot of mockery and misunderstanding along the way. And a lot of other great investors have done the same thing. I just finished a wonderful book called Richer, Wiser, Happier by William Green. And in this book, almost every chapter, almost every great investor, you know, fund manager, uh, company leader, etc. Almost all of them suffered some mockery and misunderstanding along the way. And then they came out on top. Bill Miller, one of the greatest investors ever, he made some massive mistakes in his portfolio in 2008. And he lost, you know, he had to lay off 60 or 70 staff, thousands and thousands of investors lost money. And he refused retaliation. He refused to you know, shout back at the reporters that were literally calling this brilliant guy an idiot. And he, you know, he made, he had a lot of pain and he's never gotten over that pain completely, even though his stocks and his funds have come roaring back and crushed the market for the last decade. Those scars are still there mm. and he, he'll never forget that. We talk about um, the millionaire next door. Is that something that you have found that, um, you know, clearly you've got uh, bright, shiny, uh, you know, Lambo driving um, athletes and, and celebrity figures, but that's not typ your typical millionaire. Um, your typical boring investor is someone who lives next door and, and invests in relationships, right? Yeah. <clears throat> that's another thing that came out of the, uh, richer, wiser, happier books. Some of the greatest investors, not all, but some of them have recognized that, you know, that having a flashy car, having the great mansion, having the amazing vacation homes wasn't the route to happiness. I mean, uh, that some had those things, but they realized there was, there, they weren't the route to happiness. The last chapter of richer, wiser, happier focuses on a guy, he's lesser known than some of the famous investors like Buffett, but he is just like, I mean, we're talking about the guy next door. He finally relented at like 80 years old to letting his wife get a Lexus. Who was because, this? Oh, I wish Do you remember. Oh, I'll, I'll you know, read the I book. Have no a, problem. <laughs> the book's not within reach. And no. the guy is, he's sort of obscure, but he's an amazing investment advisor with a fairly small fund. Talk about a guy with an inner scorecard. He, he didn't have, you know, he didn't have the outer scorecard. Buffett talks about that. And one of the chapters in my next book is about Buffett's inner scorecard, which means you're not judging yourself and others based on all the outward trappings, but on the inner on the inner soul on relationships etc that the the kind of the end of the book which are wiser happier talked about that you know like the happiest people in the world have the best relationships um there's a company called exchange right they're a wonderful commercial real estate investment firm and the founder and I were talking in November and he was telling me how he and the co-founder have and, and they're young guys in their 30s They've given away $41 million to charity. 
in the last several years. They live on a fraction of their income. They invest enough to take care of their wife and kids if something happens to them and they give away the rest. And so often, not always, the boring investors are the people you see living down the street. Uh, there's somebody, you know, on my street that is actually quite wealthy, but it's got a 300,000 miles on his old Toyota pickup truck. And you just wouldn't know he was as successful as he is. Have you found that those relationships, um, how, how do you cultivate those relationships in your life? Are you intentional about uh, reaching out or when you're a fund manager and you're looking for capital, clearly you have marketing channels, but, but what are the ways that you tend to attract the boring investor? to your operation? We just keep talking about these concepts. You know, I, I was actually a little nervous after I got off stage in Dallas when you and I were there together and you heard this talk for the second time, uh, thinking that people must think, oh, well, Wellings Capital, Paul's fund must have really low returns. And that's actually not necessarily true. In fact, we're targeting mid-teens returns typically. But of course, that doesn't mean we'll get those, but I mean, we're targeting that. Um, but, the, you know, we, we, we're, we're attracting people who have a long-term mindset. We're attracting people who don't use gambling language, who aren't talking about, you know, rolling the dice mm -hmm. and flipping a coin. You know, if you, if you continue to play double or nothing, you'll eventually end up on nothing. And then what will you have left to double? You'll have the chance to start over again. And we want to keep banging that drum. And we expect we're going to continue to attract people, investors who think that same way. In fact, I'm thinking about starting a podcast, uh, taking Buffett and Charlie Munger and William Green, all those great investors in the stock world and translating their concepts over to real estate to try to, you know, help real estate investors have that long-term mindset as well. I always say the best uh, advice I ever got was that real estate is best bought and never sold. Yeah, you bet. You bet. I think that's true. And I think a lot of the people who are going for these supercharged IRRs right mm. now, you know, the internal rate of return can be manipulated by selling quickly. Well, I think a lot of them are really going to regret that, you know, when they sold a property in 10 months or 18 months that they could have held for 10 or 20 years, I think they're going to regret it. Well, and even inside Collective Genius, I think there's so many people, um, you know, that have a wholesale mentality um, taking the cash now and paying tax as opposed to building wealth through real estate mm -hmm. holdings. Right. Um, you know, though it's one thing to, to get a house under contract at 50,000 and sell it for 70,000 and take 20 grand right now, but why not hold on to the $50,000 asset? And that would be worth, you know, triple that in, uh, in 20 years time. So, yeah, I agree. Um, moving along, um, your, the, the end of your, uh, your presentation here, you start to talk about um, the ways that boring investors actually invest their time because they invest in silence and solitude and the Sabbath and, and they invest in happiness. Can you delve into a little bit about what you meant by a boring investor invests in silence and solitude and Sabbath? Yeah. <clears throat> you know, Mark, I used to love Saturdays and Sundays. I really did. And the reason I did is because the emails and the phone calls from work slowed down. And you might think, well, that's a good guy. Well, my motive wasn't what you might think because I loved that because I could get more work done. I actually thought Saturday and Sunday is a great day to get more done because I'm not being interrupted so much. And you know what? That wasn't the best way to live. And I think my health suffered. I'm sure my relationships suffered. Um, I'm sure, you know, uh, I, I didn't get as much done as I probably thought I did either. My, I had a coach who recently said to me about a year ago, he said, you know, if you could clone yourself and each of you work 14 hour days, you get a lot more done, huh? And I was like, yeah, yeah, you know, that'd be great. And he's like, uh, no, he's like, you know, the, the entrepreneur's work's never done. And you would just create more mm. stuff for yourself to do. And you'd still feel like you <clears throat> ran out of time at the end of every day yep. with your current mindset. And so it's been really good for me to revamp that and really think more about, you know, silence and solitude and, and taking a Sabbath, taking a day or maybe two days completely off every week 
where I don't think about work. I don't do any work emails or texts. It, it's been really, really good. And of course, studies now, science overwhelmingly backs this up. I mean, we were, we were created to have silence, solitude, Sabbath. And I think we were created to invest in happiness as well. Really interesting study. You can Google this globally. The study found out that people are as happy as they'll ever, ever be at about a $95,000 annual income. And that's including in the U.S. Now, you can argue the 95, it might be 80 for somebody or 180 for somebody else. But at 95,000, people are as happy as they'll be. And when they hit 120, 180, 200,000, 200, you know, a, a, a million, 10 million, they're no happier. In fact, there's a curve that slightly starts tapering down mm. and says they might become more unhappy as they juggle more stress, pressures, relational problems, et cetera, as they make more. But that's not my point. My point is, if you're already making 95000 a year, and you can really hear this, imagine this. Imagine that you, get, you getting from 95 or whatever your number is, let's say it's 120, you getting to that next level, you might not be any happier. So is it really worth it to work all weekend, every weekend? Is it really worth it to not go to your kid's soccer game? Is it really worth it not to go out with your friends or your spouse and hang out because you've got to get more work done? If you're already as happy as you'll ever be, well, maybe you'll be happier doing these other things. And that's what I'm talking about. Wise words. Uh, I know a lot of our audience um, are passive investors that are um, actively working their existing job. And I know that this would probably resonate even in, in their field of expertise. Uh, Daniel Marcos is my CEO coach and, and often tells me that um, his ideal work week is two days of strategy, two days of execution and three days of rest. And I'm trying to live into that so it's wonderful yeah. man i'd love to get there too it's a challenge you know there's always to your point um the entrepreneur's work is never done i mean there's just right. always opportunity out there that's the the thing i really struggle with paul is you know you feel like you're letting you know you have a big team of, of people and you have investors that would happily invest in more deals if i could just go find one more deal i could get more people investing in real estate and there's there's always a deal out there and then you're you know, you look on social media and someone just closed a big deal. It's like, oh, that could have been mine. Uh, it's, a, it's a death spiral sometimes. You know, social media probably is a big influence on, on that impact as, as well, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely true. I mean, there's so many people making so much money right now. Like Alistair McDonald said, they're at Freedom Founders and CG. You know, um, it's hard to tell who the experts and who the lucky amateurs are right now. But as Warren Buffett said, the tide's been rising for over a decade. There's mm. going to be a day when the tide goes out, and then we'll see who's skinny dipping. For sure. Talk to me about your last two slides here. Um, you talk about boring investors investing in the unseen realm where there is no apparent ROI. What do you mean by the unseen realm? Yeah, I don't know how many people have heard of William Wilberforce, but he was born in the mid 1700s in England to incredible wealth, status, popularity. He was a just like kind of the, you know, the not the class clown necessarily, but just the most popular, most likely to succeed kind of guy. And at 21, I believe it was, he was eligible to run for parliament in England and he did. And he was the youngest person ever elected to the English par parliament, at least at that time. And I believe it was 1790 or so. Um, I might have that year off a little bit, but it was in the 1780s or not early 90s. And anyway, he was he came face to face with the horrors of human trafficking, also known as slavery. And he was horrified and it was so horrifying to him that he just had this revelation that he wanted to give his life for this. So he traded all his popularity, eventually his wealth and his health um, to go on a crusade that lasted for decades that effectively ended slavery in England. It spilled over to the United States and most of the Western world. And so there's billions of people 
thanking, who should be thanking William Wilberforce today, that, you know, that he gave his life for this. But he was investing in the unseen realm. Talk about somebody who was mocked. His former friends just mocked him and laughed at him for, you know, giving his life for these people that he, that many of them considered less than human. Uh, but he did. And there was no apparent return on investment on earth, but what an incredible life he has and what an incredible legacy. While lots of other people around him who mocked him are long forgotten, um, his legacy will live on forever. Uh, Jesus said, don't invite, when you give a banquet, don't invite your friends and the most important people there. Invite those people who will never repay you. And William Wilberforce did that really, really well. Powerful. I love that. What do you want to be? Uh, you talk about uh, boring investors leaving a legacy. I'll ask you a little bit about that, but also um, how you would like to be remembered. What is the legacy that you want to, to leave? Yeah. Um, so I woke up on October 7th, 1997, with a couple million dollars in the bank, for, which was a lot of money for a 33 year old, uh, for sure. And I wasn't any, I was happy. I was satisfied that we had done that when we sold our company, but I wasn't any real happier than we were before. I needed a big why. And I would encourage people to get a big why before they hit it big. And that big why should be something where you can, you know, you can know that you've left a legacy on the earth. You can know that what you've done matters and changed someone's life, your families, your own, others, and maybe left an impact on society. Mark, um, if you took the record profits, not the average, the record profits of Apple, General Motors, Nike, and Starbucks, and you added those record profits together and doubled that number, that's the approximate annual profits uh, from human trafficking right now. There's more slaves in the world than there has ever been in history. And it's happening right under our noses. Sadly, since we started talking about 37 minutes ago, um, approximately 370 people have been sold or captured into slavery. And um, I'd like to believe if I was alive in Wilberforce's day, I would have been an abolitionist fighting against slavery. And I'd like to believe if I was an adult in the 1960s in the U.S., I'd have been fighting for civil rights. Well, this is a civil right. It is slavery, and it's happening right in front of us. And so I would recommend if you don't have a big audacious goal, if you don't have a big why, some reason to live a legacy, consider fighting human trafficking and rescuing its victims. And to answer your question, that's what our company, Wellings Capital, and that's what my family is committed to doing. That's fantastic. I know it's a passion project for you and something that you're going to impact the world by. So appreciate all your hard work and, and that capacity. It's, uh, it's inspiring for sure. Mm, thank you. For all those watching out there that would love to uh, get in touch with you, Paul, um, do you uh, have an Instagram account or uh, social media that you um, that you would like to direct people to? Yeah, uh, Instagram would be hashtag Paul Moore Invest. And do I have to say hashtag anyway? At um, Paul Moore Invest. Yep. Yeah, but that's it. At I knew something was funny when I said it. <laughs> you got you it. You can tell how much spend time I spend on there. No, well, you're um, just a, you're a valuable resource for the community and and uh, someone that I look <laughs> to for for wisdom. Um, you know, anyone that has uh, lighter shade color hair than I, I always respect. <laughs> I love yes, the, the silver haired fox. Tell my that, wife that. <laughs> so that uh, can, no, the best place to reach me is at my website though, wellingscapital.com. And if you go to wellingscapital.com slash resources. You'll actually get a bunch of free stuff, including ebooks on how to invest in commercial real estate, how to invest in self storage, mobile home parks, et cetera. That's fantastic. What a great give. We'll make sure that our audience gets that. Uh, for those of you that are listening on YouTube, remember to uh, subscribe so you don't miss any of our video content. Um, hit the uh, yeah, hit the subscribe button. Um, and for those that are uh, listening on Audible or Spotify, um, please give us a thumbs up and a like. It always helps to uh, gain more exposure and impact uh, people. So people like Paul Moore can be heard 
uh, from more and more and more people. Paul, this has been uh, a super fun recap uh, from me, but I know enthralling for other people. So I just appreciate you spending so much time on the show with us today, and I wish you all the best in the future. Thanks so much, Mark. It's great to be here. Thank you. You're listening to Mistake Free Real Estate Radio, the authority in passive real estate investing. No late night calls, no clogged drains, no tenant nightmares. Take the passive investor's approach to real estate investing and trust a turnkey professional. Learn more at mistakefreerealestate.com. Until next time, remember, you don't get rich from what you earn, you get rich from what you own.